Hi everyone, it's wonderful to be with you for our online gathering today. Um, I've had the privilege this week of catching up with a number of people in our community who are still very much engaging with our online um, offerings and that's so exciting to hear. We're going to continue to put resources into online and prioritise online. We realise for some people when they're away from a physical site um, on a Sunday it's a great way to catch up. Uh, we, for people in Farnborough, until we're meeting, it's a great way to stay involved. Uh, for those who don't feel safe to come back yet on a Sunday, um, it's a great way to get involved. And for many people looking in on Kareth, wondering whether they're going to become part of our community, it's the first step for them. So I'm loving what God is doing online, and it's so wonderful to have you with us today. And we're going to today continue our series looking at creation care and how we play our part in caring for our planet. And today we're going to look at day four of the Genesis account, this very first book in the Bible, and this account of the creation of the world. And in Genesis chapter 1 verse 14 we read about day four and it says this, God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years, and let them be lights in the vaults of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light to the earth, to govern the day and the night and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. Oh, there's so much we could say from this passage. I'd love to talk right now about rhythm and how we find rhythm in life and how you know the, the, the whole imposition on our world of light and dark, of, of sun and moon, gives a rhythm to our world. You think of things like the tides and how important that is for us, but I haven't got time to do that today, and that's not the task. Instead, I want to speak about how does God use the heavens to speak to us? How does God use this particular part of creation to speak into our lives? I didn't grow up in a Christian home. My parents aren't Christians. And I never went to church growing up. I didn't have any exposure to Christianity. And with the, the very first time I, in my life, I remember having what I would describe as a spiritual experience, not necessarily a Christian experience, was an 11 or 12 year old looking up into the night sky. I remember a really cloudless night uh, where the stars were really bright and just looking, um, laying on the ground actually, and just looking into the sky and just being struck, first of all, by the enormity of it all. It's just like vast and it just goes on and on and on for unimaginable distances. And then also what a tiny part of it all that I was, how insignificant I was in the scheme of things. And there was a sense of wonder and a sense of awe, a sense that this can't all have just happened by chance. It can't just be an accident, a time and place. And if it was, my life would be meaningless, but it didn't seem to be how it was. And without realising it, I was experiencing a bit of what the psalmist David spoke about. In one of his psalms, Psalm 19, he says this, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from you. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. And David speaks of how creation, and particularly how the, the, the skies, how the stars, how the sun, how the moon speak to us of God and his wonder and his glory. Got a few pictures here. I wonder whether you've ever stood on a cloudless night and just stared into the stars. I remember one time I was in Zambia and we were in the middle of nowhere anywhere and then there was a power cut and all the lights went off in the middle of the night and the stars suddenly just came alive and just staring into the night sky. You realise what light pollution does but if you've ever been in one of those places which is dark at night and the stars are just alive. I guess we've all had the privilege of experiencing a wonderful sunrise or sunset. I was down in our West White site recently and on the Saturday night before preaching on the Sunday we were on the beach watching the sunset 
down over the sea there and it was just spectacular. And this sense of beauty and wonder and awe. Or maybe you've contemplated the moon on a clear night and looked up at this you know, little planet above us and just, like, again, just the wonder, the glory of it all. So before we go on to think about God speaking specifically through creation, I want to leave you with this beautiful picture of the sunset for a few moments. You might even want to pause the video at this point and just contemplate the beauty of God's creation. Perhaps you're in a group, you might want to even share times that you've, you've looked at creation, maybe looked at a sunrise or a sunset or the moon or the stars, and it's really spoken to you. And uh, allow God, yeah, just allow God for a moment um, to speak to you through the wonders of, of the, the sun, the moon, the stars, and see what he might want to say to you. And then when you've done that, come back and join us in a few moments. And God's often used, um, as we saw in that psalm, that the, the, the sky is to speak generally of God, of, of who he is, of his power, of his majesty, of his glory. But God's also, through history, used the skies to speak specifically to people, to speak specific messages to people. One of those was this person called Abraham. If you remember Abraham in the Old Testament, the bit of the Bible before Jesus, was promised that he was going to have many children. And he tried to produce a child by um, sleeping with somebody he shouldn't have done and produced this child called Ishmael. And God comes to him after the birth of this child and God says this, the word of the Lord came to him, to Abraham. This man, Ishmael, will not be your son, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And God took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And I suspect every time after that, when Abraham doubted what God had said, he would look into the skies and just imagine like the countless stars. That was what his descendants were going to be. And we know that God fulfilled in time that promise to Abraham. Or fast forward to the birth of Jesus, um, where God speaks to some wise men. Read this in Matthew's account of the life of Jesus. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And just as God spoke through the stars to his people on the establishment of his people in Israel, at the arrival of his son, God also speaks through the stars to these people in a far off land. God also says he's going to speak through the skies when Jesus comes again. In the book of Acts, um, the story of the early church in the Bible, we read this. God says, I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And just as the skies announced um, the foundation of the nation of Israel, just as the skies announced the birth of Jesus, the skies are going to also announce the return of Jesus. There's a day when Jesus will come again and he will complete the work that he began on the cross. When he died on the cross, he died for our sin. He died so that we could be reconciled to him so that we could become his friends again, so that the barrier between us and him could be removed. But Jesus didn't just die so that we could be reconciled to God. Jesus died so that the whole of creation, the whole of the universe could be reconciled to God. When Adam and Eve sinned, it wasn't just them who were impacted by that sin. The whole of creation was polluted and corrupted. And when Jesus comes again, he's going to undo all that because on the cross he died so that those things could be reconciled. This is what we read in one of Paul's letters to the church in place called Colossae. He said this, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, in Jesus. And through him, get this, and through Jesus to reconcile to himself all things. What do you say? All things where you are. Jesus came to reconcile all things, whether things on earth, 
or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And Jesus didn't just come to reconcile us to God, he came to reconcile the whole of creation to him. And it's so important as we think about creation care that we understand that end point of what Jesus achieved on the cross and what he's going to do when he comes again. Now some Christians, some Christians have an eschatology. That word just means what's going to happen at the end times. They have an eschatology which says that at that end, everything is going to be destroyed. Everything is going to be just like blown up, you know, burnt up, and God's just going to make a whole new thing. I had an experience of this, that sort of thinking um, this week. Um, on Sunday, I was down in our farmer building and I was part of the, the working party that was painting the kids' rooms, um, getting ready for us to move in there, hopefully sooner rather than later, and uh, seeing this transformation. And to do that, I wore some old clothes. I wore an old pair of jeans. I don't know if you can see here, um, but I got them quite painted. Um, and I wore an old pair of jeans that, that are worn out and they've got a few holes in them because I knew that there's a day coming that I'm going to throw these jeans away. I'll put them in one of those recycling bins um, somewhere around Bracknell and uh, hopefully they'll go to make another pair of jeans or something. But, but I'm not worried about what happens to these jeans because I know that I'm not going to wear them again in any sort of posh setting because Trina wouldn't allow me to do that. Um, you know, that they're destined to be discarded. And some Christians take that sort of approach with the world. Hey, well, because the world's going to be discarded and God's going to make a new one, then, well, we can just get rid of it. We don't need to worry about looking after it. We don't need to worry about caring for it because God's going to make another one and we can just do whatever we want with this one. Just like my jeans, we can just trash them. We don't need to worry if we drop paint on them or whatever. Um, it just doesn't matter. But that's a complete misunderstanding of what's going to happen on that day when Jesus comes again. In the book of Revelation, we started in the first book of the Bible, Genesis, but in the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, we read this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. For the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne says, Behold, I'm making all things new. Now you might go, well, that seems to agree with that sense. God's making all new things. He's making all things new. He's, he's um, you know, all this stuff's going to go away, and God's going to make a new heaven and a new earth and get rid of the old one. And we sometimes imagine, um, when I was growing up, I used to watch those Tom and Jerry cartoons. I don't know if any of you ever watched those. And uh, sometimes they had like heaven and hell in those cartoons. And heaven was always this place where, um, I think it was always, was it Jerry was the mouse? Um, ended up in heaven and, uh, and would like float around with wings on a sort of cloud, um, singing hymns and, and just basically being angelic all day. And it was this sense of being like disembodied, of an unreal place, of a place that isn't really physical, of a place that isn't really like this place. But the Bible's description of this new heaven and new earth is, first of all, a very physical place. It's a place that's real. It's a place where we can touch and feel. It's a place that, that's very real. Secondly, it's interesting to note in this new world, it isn't a case that we go to heaven to be with God. Sometimes we use that sort of language, you know, when someone's died or they've gone to heaven to be with God. But when Jesus comes again, it isn't that we go to heaven, but that heaven comes to us. Heaven comes down and, and suddenly heaven and earth are reunited again. The curse of what happened in the Garden of Eden is reversed. And suddenly God dwells with his people. God is just amongst us and with us. But thirdly to note, when, when John, who's writing this, says it's a new heaven and a new earth. It doesn't mean new in terms of being brand new. The word actually means it's like a renewed version of the old one. And the newness is about this new heaven and new earth having a newness of quality 
and essence. Whereas the old earth was wearing out, whereas the old earth was decaying, this new earth and our new bodies, praise God, they won't decay, they won't degrade, there'll be no death, there'll be no illness, there'll be no COVID, there'll be no plagues, no crying, no pain. You see, it doesn't say that God is making all new things, but God is making all things new. Tom Wright, a famous Christian scholar, puts it this way. God's plan is not to abandon this world, which he said was very good. Rather, he intends to remake it. And when he does, he will raise all his people to new bodily life, to live in it. That's the promise of the Christian gospel. So God is going to remake us. God is going to renew us. He's already done that in our spirits. He's going to do that in our bodies when he gives us resurrection bodies. But he's also going to do that in the earth. He's going to remake, renew this earth. And that gives us a responsibility to care for this earth. Because when we care for it now, we foreshadow, we begin that work which God is going to complete when Jesus comes again. You know that line in the Lord's Prayer when we pray, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And when we pray that, we're praying for that what's true in that new heaven and new earth will be true now on the earth. That's what happens when we pray for healing. We know that in the new heaven and new earth, there will be no sick people. So when we pray for healing, we're praying for that kingdom to come now. When we pray for God to deal with injustice in the world, we know that the new heaven and the new earth will have no injustice. So when we pray that prayer, we're praying for that to become a reality now. And when we care for the earth now, we're, we're foreshadowing what God is going to do then and saying, God, make that a reality now. Tom Wright goes on, he says, the message of the resurrection, of this raising to new life, is that the present world matters. That the problems and pains of this present world matter and that the living God has made a decisive bridgehead into this present world with his healing and all-conquering love. And that in the name of this strong love, all the evils, all the injustices and all the pains of the present world must now be addressed with the news that healing, justice and love have won the day. That's why we pray, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So when it comes to creation care, what does that look like? It means that we realise that this, that this world, our world, is God's good creation. It's part of what Jesus died for on the cross. And one day it will be renewed. It will be reconciled to God. And we anticipate that work. We, we see heaven on earth when we become part of that renewal here today. Now I realise for some people this series is proving a bit of a struggle. I've had some people say like, really, Simon, as Christian, should we be talking about this creation care thing? Um, why are we spending eight weeks on a subject like this? Are we in danger of losing sight of the gospel, of our unique message of salvation in Jesus? Are we being hijacked by the world's agenda or just following the latest hot topic in society? And I want to say to all of us, as a community and wider, a resounding no to all of those. Coming out of this pandemic, I'm more committed than ever to be a church that is centred around Jesus and his call on our lives. As we come out of this pandemic, I'm through helping lead a church where we just try to attract a crowd. Where we try and make everything look shiny and polished on the outside, even if we're struggling to deliver that on the inside. Where we're trying to do whatever we can just to get people to stay. I don't want to do those things anymore. I want to be around people who are committed to following Jesus wherever he leads and whatever it costs. I want to be around people who see their commitment to Jesus not just as a Sunday thing, but something which shapes and defines every area of our lives. A people whose only desire in life is to do and follow Jesus. And part of that call, part of our unique message to the world is to care for creation. As we've seen in weeks, previous weeks, well, that's partly because it's a, a justice issue. The, the climate changing is impacting people around the world, and we recognise that. But this week, I want us to say, hey, we need to care for creation because we understand that this is God's world, the world that he created and called good. 
And when we care for it, we foreshadow that day when he will come again and renew it. And we begin that work today as we get involved in caring for our world. So, I want to encourage you to come on this journey. We'll continue to do all the things we've always done as a church. We will proclaim the name of Jesus as clearly as we can. We will share our faith as openly as we can. We will continue to care for the poor and the impoverished in our communities. We continue to stand up against injustice wherever we see it, whether we see racial injustice, whether we see injustice around the world. We'll, begin to, we'll continue to do everything we can to be that force for Jesus on this planet. But we'll also care and demonstrate our love for Jesus by caring for our planet. So yes, we will spend eight weeks talking about creation care. If I'm honest, after 32 years in this church, in my experience, it's the first time we've ever spoken about it. So we've got a bit of catching up to do. And I want to encourage all of us to be taking our little baby steps. Katrina and I are starting to do those. We're eating less meat. I've been exploring where my pension is invested and whether I can move it into ethical funds. We've started using more environmentally friendly cleaning products. We've switched our energy supplier to one that supplies um, electricity from renewable sources and offsets our gas. I know other people have been taking those steps and others. Let's continue to press into that journey, confident that what we can do, as we do what we can do, God will come and do what only he can do. We're going to finish in the moment by praying the Lord's Prayer together, to pray that prayer that Jesus ta taught us to pray. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. But before that, I want to just show you a little video uh, from a wonderful couple in our church, Neil and Becca Taylor. And they're just going to tell us about some of the next steps that they've been taking and encouraging us into those next steps as a community. So please take a look at the screen. One last question then. Um, have you got any final kind of words of encouragement or guidance or wisdom for the people um, in church who are watching this now and any, any thoughts for them? Yeah, so I think um, the way we started out really was just picking one thing a month to change and framing it as an act of worship and that just made it really easy. It doesn't have to be a big thing. Like we just started um, using our bread maker again and not buying bread in plastic bags yeah. and then we bought shampoo bars and then we bought something else the next month and one thing a month felt really achievable and actually over time it's just sort of built up without us really even thinking about it um, yeah and I definitely do think of those little things as acts of worship and I think that helps to frame it that way as well yeah I think I think I would agree so don't don't let the task ahead seem overwhelming just Pick something, one thing, and start doing it. That's really good. Cool. Well, thanks, guys. Really appreciate your time. We'll leave you to your kitchen again thanks. so you can carry on with life. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much. Cheers. Thanks, Ben. Thanks. So thanks, Neil and Becca. That was excellent. If you go on the website, um, you'll find a whole load of those videos. Um, and there's a whole long version and then cut up into little bits. We'll release those over the next few weeks of, of Neil and Becca talking about the steps they've been taking and how we might respond to those. So as I said, we're going to finish by praying together the Lord's Prayer. That's what we're passionate about. We want to see heaven on earth. We want to see God's kingdom come and his will being done. We see that when we see somebody decide to follow Jesus. We see that when somebody is lifted out of debt. We see that when somebody is healed. We see that when injustice is challenged and overcome. And we see that when we care for our planet. So please join with me together. We'll put the words on the screen because um, there's so many different versions of this prayer. So we can pray together. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for being with us. Hey, please think about what your next steps might be and see what you're doing as we care for creation as part of what it means to follow Jesus and see his kingdom come and his will be done.